We've got Jake Middleton from the Minnesota Wild joining us this week on the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast. And Jacob, uh, look, we talk a lot of hockey on the podcast. It's a hockey podcast. That's what we do. But we like to have some fun along the way as well and, and maybe dive back into history. So we're going to start with your history and, and the early days of pro hockey in the American League. And a little birdie tells me that you had a pretty impressive brick laying career as part of your routine in, in, in getting ready for the day ahead in the American Hockey League. So tell us about your brick laying adventures and the type of routine that you had to go through day by day. It wasn't exactly a, a career. It was more of a, a summer job that paid really well and gave me nice big shoulders in the off season. Um, but no, my brother and I, we, uh, yeah, no, we got a, we got a gig from a guy, Rob Lewis, back in Stratford, Ontario, who set us up with uh, uh, being laborers for his masonry. So we'd get up at six and go to the gym. Uh, he was, it was early mornings for the, for the job, but he'd let us go to the gym before we got to work. So we'd show up around 8.30 for work after we went to the gym and trained. And then we'd uh, go and carry, I don't know how many bricks every day to the sides of houses and load them up the, up the scaffolding. But no, it was, it was a fun summer job. Okay. So, when I grew up, I was 16 <laughs> years old. My dad owned a concrete business. And so at the end of the green chain, all these blocks come off, 3,040 pound blocks a day. I had to pile them. And uh -huh. if you didn't keep up, they fell on your feet. <laughs> so you and your brother must have had some shenanigans piling these things, no? Yeah, there was the shenanigans. Books? There was things would get heated. Um, but we had the. Uh, <laughs> We had the we had the sand pile to mix the mortar, the concrete. Yeah. So if you had any disputes, you would go to the sand pile and we'd have a sand pile match. Now who wins? Who won back then? Today to the media as well. I got I said my brother is tougher than me, absolutely, but I will never lose a fight to him because I got that mental edge of being the older brother for so long because it was it was 12 years old probably at 13 he was two years younger but he started getting bigger than me so I had to find ways to because you can't lose to your little brother right it's just not it's not in the playbook so I do think it's tougher than me but like I said these are my fiancés I go with the cords for this reason cords old school I like old it old school buddy so Jacob I had two sets of kids uh three years apart older boys older boy younger brother older boy younger brother and the older boy was always tormenting the younger brother the 33 year old when they were young he'd go by smack the younger guy just a little bit <laughs> in the back of the head and i'd say why do you do that and he's like because i want him to be a little bit scared of me in case he gets bigger when he's older like was that a strategy in the middleton house that, that wasn't my strategy um he was always <laughs> bigger than me so it was usually just right to the fisticuffs. I, ha I have one memory for sure. He, we were fighting in the basement. He gave me a bloody nose and I had seen some red. I had him on his back and he looked up at me and says, do whatever. You're the only one who's going to get in trouble here. And I had blood ripping down my nose and he knew he had that knack where he's like, mom's going to get mad at you and not me. So do whatever you want here. <laughs> so a little now bit opposite. You're, you're talking about Keaton, right? Yeah. And the, like he's in the Colorado system. I know he's a former third-round pick of the Toronto Maple Leafs. He's a big dude. Isn't he Huge. like 6'6"? Six, six? Yeah, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, 245. He's a mammoth of a man. <laughs> That's tough. Uh, talk about the mustache, brother. I mean, that is a high-quality Ray Ferraro vintage <laughs> mustache from the 80s. Yeah, I get a lot of Tom Selleck uh, uh, comments about it, but uh, no, it's it's. If you, I saw my billets last night in Montreal actually, and they, I had a mustache in junior as well, and it's because I had a very patchy beard. Um, so I grew this mustache for two years in junior. I put it away for a few years. I tried going with the beard because of uh, Burnsy and Jumbo and San Jose, and then uh, I lost a bunch of teeth four of them on the top. So now I got the mustache to kind of cover that. Everyone just looks at the mustache instead of me not having my four front teeth. <laughs> and you're never going to get the teeth fixed, right? I actually, I got the surgery last year. So I had to get, a, I broke the whole like plate on my front uh, jaw. 
So I went in and I got a bone graft in June, um, which it's like a long process. I get this bone graft done. And then after a year, I can get the post put in. And then whenever I'm done playing, then I can get the, the teeth put in. So it is, I'm working on it. My fiance would really like me to have a nice smile one of these days. So, uh, and my mom too, she spent a lot of money on me as dentist growing up. So she's a little disheartened <laughs> from this, but no, it's, uh, I'm going to get them back. It's just a, a bit of a process. Think of your, you get yourself into pro hockey, you sign with San Jose and you're in the American league. I, I watched you play on Saturday for the first time live. And I was telling Dregs off air, how the hell did you last in the American league for five years? Like, why did it take you so long? to be a legit NHL or because you are. Yeah. I I wish I had an answer for you. I honestly don't. Um, (laughs) It's one of those things where you just, you show up to camp and every year it felt like there was a new flavor coming into training camp, but I would kind of get passed over. I was very fortunate though. I got to be a seventh D around some great teams. So it was different in in San Jose with the American league team being right down the hallway. um, I still got, a lot of experience in the NHL. You know, I would, I'd practice and then I'd warm up for the Sharks. And then the next day I'd go down and morning skate and play with the Barracuda. And the next day it was back to a warm up with the, with the Sharks and then back and forth and back and forth. So I, it made it fun. It paid well. You know, it was, even mm-hmm. though you were up and down when you're on an entry level contract, living in Northern California, you, you get a little bit of a pay bump going up and down and, it was the last year. It was very frustrating, but I still I just love playing hockey. So it was it wasn't too hard. But as far as why it took so long, I wish I had an answer for you. I've had probably asked myself that question for a long time, five years, well three years I'd say. You know, the first two years was a learning curve, but no, the the last three was like I wonder why it's taken so long. But uh, I'm just happy I'm in the position I'm in now, and everything's working out well. Did it feel like you were going backwards ever? Like oh, you know, big you time! With the new guys coming, and you're like, "What about me?" Hey, this this off season was one where this training camp. I I went into training camp, and it was almost a blessing because I was very carefree. I thought all summer long. Um, I went through these surgeries of my face and whatnot, and all summer long, I thought I was destined to just go to the American League for the whole year, get my minor league salary. And, uh, it just, it went into camp and I was, I didn't have a care in the world. I played the game the same way I did in the preseason games. I actually fought a few times in training camp and it was because I knew we were going to lose our tough guys in the American league. And I thought I was like, okay, I'm going to have to fight these big heavyweights in the American league now because we're losing our, our fighters there. So I was like, I may as well see how I fare against like some tough guys in the National League because I'm going to have to do this job in the American League now. Um, And it actually, it helped me. So even though I thought I was doing it to get prepared to fight in the jungle, it uh, it gave me a job in the big league. So (laughs) it worked out well. (laughs) Hey, uh, you mentioned your uh, beard mustache thing about about Joe Thornton. And uh, everybody that's been around Joe has a favorite Joe or a favorite 16 Joe Thor- Thornton stories. Um, do you have, do you have one that you, you can tell us? I mean, we've heard a million through his ex teammates before. I, I, that one you? Well, okay. So one that relates to me, it's embarrassing for me too. Cause then I mentioned this before <laughs> I would take warm ups for the sharks and then go down and play. And my warm up stall, my stall with the sharks was right beside Bernsey and Jumbo. And when you got those two going, it was hilarious. But so I don't know what it would have been. It was probably my fourth or fifth time taking warm-ups. And I'm sitting right beside Jumbo and Bernsey. And I am just there asking me questions because Jumbo's from St. Thomas and I'm from Stratford. So we had stories about the Junior B days with the Cullitans and the St. Thomas team and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> the whole game, I'm just enamored. I can't stop listening and talking to these two guys. And when it came time for warm-ups, I'm late. Like, I've got to get ready. And I'm still wanting to be in this conversation with these two. And I put the wrong shin pad on my legs. And I'm only out there taking warm-ups. So I'm not doing anything, really. You know, I'm just standing there, shooting a couple pucks, doing the butterflies. And I'm a bit of a knee knocker, as it is. You know, I got that. My knees go inside. That's how my stride is. So now I got my shin pads 
my right's on the left and the left's on the right. So it looks like my knees are even more <laughs> inverted. So I spent half the warm ups just like standing at the blue line, trying to be as bow legged as I could to, so no one saw. And then I got off of the ice at like four or five minutes on the clock and I went and got my shin pads off before anyone else got in the room because I didn't want anyone to see what just happened. But he, uh, as far as Jumbo, and that's just his personality, right? Like he had me so drawn in and tied into this conversation with the laughter with Bernsey and everyone that I put my shin pads on the, on the wrong legs. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you make the team, you're out of camp, you're on the team, and they figure it's a good idea to play yourself with Eric Carlson. And you'd played with Burns a bit. Like, how do you go and feel comfortable playing with, players like that I was able to just look at like I I'm well aware of my skill set and I know it's not much of a skill set I I had a coach in junior um Jeff Brown played for Vancouver and St. Louis his son Logan's in uh St. Louis now he would not yell at us but he would stress the fact that the National Hockey League will pay you a million dollars to high flip the puck out of the zone so, so what I could, what, as I got going and, and knowing the game more, I just was like a simplicity is, is my game. That's the only way I'm going to make any money doing this. And it's, I'm way better at that than stick handling through the neutral zone and leading the rush. So I would just, I was able to look at, at Bernsey and Carl and say, Carl, mostly he was the one who I really played with. I said, listen, you just go do your thing and let's bring you back to that Norris trophy level you were playing at. Cause if you do that, it's going to help me look really yeah. good too. So I just said, you go out there and do your thing. I'm way better at defending than playing in the offensive zone. So you just do your thing. I'm a safety valve. And if you need me, I can make a really good first pass to the wingers. So if, if <laughs> last resort, you can send it my way, but no, it was just, we had a good, and we, he's, they're very, Carl's different. He was a very intense person. He expects a lot of himself and the ones around him. And I'm fine with that. I grew up working on a brick laying job, getting yelled at. Like I had no problems going head to head with a guy and he loved that too. So it was one of those things. It was a good relationship between the the two of us as well. Cause I could take some of the heat he was bringing. I could give it back. I could simplify the game. He could bring it to another level. It was uh it was a fun, fun 45 games. I got to play with him. Mm -hmm. Now, as the year's going on, things are going pretty well for you. Um, people are starting to notice you a little more, and then all of a sudden, your name pops up in a few trade talks. Yeah. There's some rumors floating around. Like, that had to be a little crazy. No one Yeah, no, really you crazy. you guys especially. Yeah. Pierre, I had to delete I had to delete Twitter for a week there. I didn't – I couldn't go on it anymore. I'd open it up and see oh, my name everywhere. Too. <laughs> too much. Yeah, no, it was uh, – that was a crazy – it was like two weeks, I guess, for me. I, I came on pretty early um, with the trade rumors. And I had, like, I'm, I, I show up to work. I high flip the puck. I do my job and I try to go home. Even this, uh, sicky with the media here. I'm on a bit of a media tour here. Like, I, I haven't done so much media ever, really. So when he called and said, I got to do this, I said, Sicky, I'm just, I just show up, you know, like I'm a blue collar guy. I just want to show up and punch the clock and go home. But um, yeah, no, this past six weeks has been a whirlwind to say the least. But do you see what, do you see why people connect with you? You are a blue collar guy. You've made, you've made a road and a path that people can connect to. Yeah, it's, re it's relatable. Um, I don't see it. You know, I don't see it. I, I am, uh, I guess I can talk if we're at a bar stool or a bar top somewhere, I'm easy to talk to. So that's one of those things. I got a soft ear, but no, I don't see it. I don't like it. I, I don't think I'm cut out for this kind of thing, but it's cool. You know, I'm going to ride the wave while I'm on it. So. Oh yeah. Stay on it. <laughs> oh yeah, traded, for sure. You get traded to Minnesota. Do you know anything about the guys? Do you know anybody there or is it all brand new when you get in? No, I was, I was talking to my agent, Joe Resnick about this. He called cause uh, when you're looking at the, and again, I didn't hear anything other than what I'm reading on Twitter. And then I'm asking Joe because I'm like, I don't have suitcases or anything, you know, like I, I'm living in a 400 what square foot. What do you mean of, you don't have suitcases? I didn't have a suitcase. I, I called Joe. How like did you get your clothes to San Jose? I, so I live, <laughs> I own, I own five white t-shirts and five black t-shirts, three jackets and three hoodies and three pairs of jeans. And when they're done, I usually I'll just buy some more, you know, if I, I'll just go through them. 
<laughs> I don't keep an apartment. Your, your fiance deserves a medal. I've never met oh, a fiance deserves a medal. Yeah, no, she is. She's unbelievable. Cause I, I couldn't, I got to stay with her cause I couldn't imagine anyone else putting up with this. You know, it's like, I, I'm, she's in it with me, but no, I'm very, I like at the end of the year, I throw my stuff out. Like my, I buy it all on Amazon. I throw it out at the end of the year. Uh, beds, you know, the States, it's pretty cheap to, you can go to, to target and do your whole house, all your kitchen supplies and everything for 300 bucks. So <laughs> it's cheaper than getting a storage unit. But, so, uh, so you find out that you're, you're on the trade block. Uh, so do you, you go shopping for the suitcase I did. during that timeline? Well, I, called, when I you... called Joe cause we, it, we, I forget what it was. We had three games in four days in San Jose leading up to the deadline. And I called Joe uh, I was like day five. I think it was a, a Wednesday or Thursday. I called Joe. I said, Hey, listen, do you think I'm getting traded? Cause this is my only day off and I don't have a suitcase. Like, do I, I need to know what's going on here. He says, well, I like wouldn't go buy a suitcase, but he says it's very likely that you're getting traded. So I'm a bit of a procrastinator too. So I obviously did not go buy a suitcase. And at eight 30, I got called saying I was getting traded to Minnesota and it was, the mall didn't open till 11. So I'm getting calls from these guys saying, where's a flight at one. I'm like, I'm not going to make it. Like <laughs> I don't have a suitcase. The mall doesn't open till 11. <laughs> I got some stuff I got to figure out here. And my fiance was at home. She was home working, picking up ships at the hospital. So I was like, I was like, I need a day. Like I don't have, I'm not prepared for this at all. Fortunately they had a day off the next day here in Minnesota. So yeah. it, uh, it gave me some time. <laughs> oh, that's that's unbelievable. I've I've heard a guy scrambling around on trade day, yeah. but not getting on a flight because you can't pack your clothes. <laughs> well, well, it was eight thirty, and I just I didn't I wasn't it wasn't feasible, and I so I would have had suitcases, but not. She had take she had went home to pick up some ships at the hospital, so there was none. She had taken them all home to go. So if <laughs> need be, if she was there, I would have been able to get on the flight and pack my handful of t-shirts and jeans and gold but there was nothing in there at the time so I had some I always say future mids has some stuff he's going to have to figure out and that was one of those days where I wish I didn't put future mids in that position because it would have been nice to be a little prepared (laughs) now have the guys in mini noticed your uh the predictability of your wardrobe yet not yet no not yet (laughs) <laughs> it's been nice it's uh well we're playing so much too right that everyone's kind of in the you'll just throw on a pair of sweats so you can't really tell and i also you need to wear a winter jacket here in april so you can cover up the the <laughs> you, they don't know you're wearing the same t-shirt every day because you're covering it up pretty loose group though right i mean loose in the sense that you know you get along well as better teams do um i mean <laughs> What was the prank we watched? Uh, I, I think the Minnesota Wild actually posted it. Didn't yeah, they? The, right? the the styrofoam peanuts. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah. I don't know who did it, but it was that was funny. Like I've never seen anything like that. And then not only that, yesterday <laughs> we get in the shower in Montreal. Two guys are wiping their faces off, drying, and there's whip uh, shaving cream all over, yeah. them, all over. Awesome. Them. So we figure that one's a flower one, like Goligoski Goose played with flower. He says this is a this is a flower prank, but the styrofoam <laughs> one, whoever did it, is still out there. We're not sure. There's some rumblings as to who we think did it, but no one's come forward yet. But that was a good one. <laughs> you, you know, here's here's one you might think about. You know when the, where the coffee machine is in the uh in the locker room and they yeah. got all those styrofoam cups there go down about four or five cups and poke a couple of holes in the cups. oh yeah so and then just walk away somebody <laughs> i can guarantee you will be so sour that yeah they got coffee spraying out all over their legs undetectable undetectable <laughs> but the problem with that too is the the staff gets in on that too so i would hate to poke a hole in dean evison's morning coffee uh, you know, like uh, that would be, that would just be tough because we all, it's all one coffee machine, right? So I'll probably wait till I get a little more friendly. And know what he, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wait till I see well, what goes on this summer. I, uh, uh, Dean Evison was my first roommate uh, when we were 20 in the American League. Um, uh, we turned pro. We lived together in Binghamton, New York. We bought a car for $600. You can imagine what a piece of crap that thing was. Uh But have you played for a coach more intense than Dean? No, no, I haven't. But 
And and I don't like it's I haven't been around. It's What's a good that? Intent. It's a good intense. It it's yeah no like, it's he's intense but he and I and I I don't know what I played fifteen games here. He he's very intense but he's not that overbearing intense. You know he lets the team he lets the players figure it out. It's it's very cool to see because his meetings are they have a purpose and they're intense and he's got that high spoken voice which is a borderline yell but he gets his point across and like my first game I thought I was like oh god I wonder what it's going to be like playing for this guy like but he doesn't yell on the bench he doesn't come in the room in intermission and yell and scream it's all he trusts his players so much and and the leadership group here is unbelievable which so I can understand where he's coming from with that because he gets his meetings and his point across, but then it's, he's pretty quiet. You know, he'll yell at the refs a little bit. And if, if there's a play, he'll yell. But other than that, it's, he lets the players figure it out and it's worked here. I think we have one regulation loss in my 15 games that I've been here. So it's, it's pretty cool to see, but you can understand why, why guys play for him because it's, he's that intense person, but he's also a, he's behind it. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't push his thing on anything. He lets you play and lets you guys figure it out. So it's really cool to see. I've never played for anyone like him. Does this uh, season make you at all think about what the summer might hold for you? I mean, you've got to be looking at this year far differently than any other year in your past. Yeah. Yes. And no, like I, like I'm, I'm, I just want a job, you know, and I think I've played myself into one, I, whether it pays well or doesn't pay, it's going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get a race regardless, right? Yeah. No matter what it is, I'll be getting a raise from the league minimum. So it's not anything I'm too worried about. And as we came across, I'm a pretty simple man. So uh, yeah, things are looking good. But speaking of summer, it's a weird way this thing works. My wife, my fiance, she's a travel nurse. She's licensed in Minnesota. So about three weeks before the trade deadline, we were looking at, because I didn't think I was coming here. Of all the rumblings, Minnesota was yeah. not not in the uh in the talk so we were looking she's licensed here we were actually going to live here um wow. i had trained anyway, with the guy gonna move there anyway. i was going to move here anyways yeah we were going to get an airbnb huh. for three months i had known uh i'd known jeremy clark he owns a gym minnesota top team he was a fighting coach and strength coach in la when i was drafted there so i used to come here and train in the off season with la and uh, she was going to get a good gig here. I knew the Brodzinski family real well. I played with two of the brothers. They were from here, so I could get some ice. And it was all going to work out well. So now we're hmm. – I'm looking for a house now because I was like, this is – I'm restricted, <laughs> so I got to come back. And it's like I may as well buy something, you know. So it's yeah. uh, it's kind of cool how things worked out. Sounds like a perfect well, fit. Look, Jake, we'll, yeah, we'll let you go, but I want to bring something I, up that I you and Ray – I want to ask one thing, one yeah. question. So I watched you play Saturday the first time, and I told you off air. There's an old school vibe to the. That's way you what I wanted, here. yeah. And like everybody now, they got like everything so tight and the little tiny gloves and the, you know, like you need longer laces. <laughs> Just you wear your gear. You look. You could have played in the '80s and looked perfect. Well, so you'll. I wear nothing under my gear i wear i wear socks now because i saw mario ferraro get caught get cut in new york so i wear those yeah. cut proof socks but other than that i wear a, an under jock and nothing else so the media team hates me because they can't take any pictures or anything in the room and when they're doing the pregame videos and that they got to steer clear of my corner because i have nothing on except for a little jock strap so but no the old school and i would i understand the long laces part but i'm not like a tremendous skater so I would hate to trip on these long laces, but I can understand where you're coming from with the old school look. I, I got to tell you, hearing about your undergear, man, your your stall mates, they must be thrilled, eh? Uh, be thrilled. I wear a towel. I wear a towel for a lot of it. You know, like if I'm walking around the room, I'll put a towel on. Uh, Tony says he's going to get me a bathrobe to to wear around oh, <laughs> Minnesota nice. Wild number five rope. Yeah, but then I get the Hugh Hefner look and then it's like a little too old school, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well I think you can pull it off. Oh, that's okay. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, all right, Jake. Well look, man, uh, we've taken up enough of your time. All the best. You look like a perfect fit. 
uh, both on and off the ice, obviously, for the Minnesota Wild and uh, for your family in Minnesota. So keep it going and all the best. Well, thanks to you guys as well, too. I, I wanted to mention, too, you guys were a big part of my childhood growing up in southern Ontario watching TSN every day. So thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. Awesome, Jacob. All the best to you. Eh? Appreciate it, guys.